Dumelang, welcome to Face the Nation. My name is Clement Banyatela. Great to have you with us here on SABC News. On the show tonight, is our government capable of addressing the crisis of identity theft at home affairs? The department revealed today that it's cancelling the identity and travel documents of former Miss SA contestant Chidima Adechina and her Mozambican-born mother. But the bigger problem here is that there are several fraudulent applications that have been processed at night and over weekends for foreign nationals. The Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, Njabulo Nzuza, will speak to us. Also on the show, should the Mayor of Johannesburg, Dada Morero, dismiss his MMC for community safety, Cabelo Gomanda? He put him on special leave recently following his arrest in connection with a fraudulent funeral insurance scheme. But some political parties and unions are calling for him to be sacked. The Mayor of Johannesburg joins us tonight. And then later, what is the plan to deal with the recent spate of mass shootings in the country from the Eastern Cape, Western Cape, Gauteng to KwaZulu-Natal? This appears to be getting out of control. And these shootings are often perpetrated with illegal and unlicensed firearms. The National Police Commissioner, General Fadima Samula, will tell us how the police are ramping up their efforts. Plus, we'll wrap up the show with a conversation with Pastor Basika Mboro Mutsuene. He's been out of jail now for some time. I'm sure he's had some time to reflect on his actions. So what are his reflections? That's what I'll be asking him. But first, my comment. So the Home Affairs Minister says it will cancel the identity and travel documents of former Miss SA contestant. Uh, Tijima Adechina and her Mozambican-born mother. Remember, they are facing probable fraud charges after the department revealed that her mother may have committed identity fraud. So earlier today, the department informed Parliament's Portfolio Committee that it's completed investigations on this matter and has now, that investigation has now been handed over to the Hawks. Here's what the department said earlier in Parliament. We've handed over the file, we've completed the work which was done by counter corruption and security services. That work is done. We've actually written uh, to both uh, Adichina and the mom and indicated, I think the last day was yesterday, and they need to give us reasons as to why those documents should not be withdrawn. As of yesterday, we have not received any response and therefore the department will be proceeding uh, with the withdrawal of those documents in line with the identification Act. So this investigation into the citizenship of Adichina has really brought the social impact of falsified identity into the spotlight. The Home Affairs Department says it's on a major clampdown on fraud and corruption, particularly by foreign nationals attempting to stay in the country through illegal means. And sometimes they work with corrupt Home Affairs officials. So the department has a lot of work to do here. They also say that their investigations have revealed that there are several fraudulent applications that have been processed at night, sometimes over the weekends. In fact, at least a fifth of over 51,000 visa application initially rejected on suspicion of fraud were subsequently approved. So this is quite a serious problem. The question we're asking you though tonight is, what needs to be done to address this crisis of fraud in the application and allocation of visas. This issue of identity theft. What do you think needs to be done? Uh, you can send us a WhatsApp voice note right now on 078 459 1897. Uh, remember to tell us your name and surname and where you are sending the voice note from. Please keep them at 30 seconds. Alternatively, you can send us an X on at Face the Nation SABC. All right, let's pick up on that conversation with the Deputy Minister of Home Affairs, Jabulo Nzuza. Deputy Minister, thank you so much for making time for us. Good evening. Good evening, Clement, and good evening to all the viewers at home, and thank you very much for having us today. What does this decision to cancel the identity and travel documents of uh, Chidima Adichina and her mom actually mean? You know, what is their current identity status? 
Well, you will remember that uh, we had already indicated that we found fraud uh, in the case of the mother, uh, winning that the citizenship was obtained fraudulently. Now, in South Africa, as we've been saying before, that the child follows the status of the parent. We then had to move over and then uh, write to Chitima herself to say that she must make representations because the issue of the mother was done and dusted. We concluded the investigations, were able to pick up prima facie evidence of fraud. After that, we then referred the file to the Hawks, who are now in high needles looking for her so that they could start the process of prosecution. And then we also wrote to her to say she must make representations because if her mother's identity was obtained uh, illegally, it means it brings her own uh, citizenship into question. Uh, the closing date was, I think, yesterday when we said she must respond. She has not responded. And as such, even with her, we will now start the process of a uh, throwing back the citizenship. And what does that mean? It means that the person no longer becomes a South African citizen, is removed from the uh, database of South Africans. And uh, that means that the person stops being a South African citizen because in any way, some of those documents will have been obtained uh, illegally. But we had the right to make sure that we follow the law right okay. up until the T. Yes. So you, you believe that her mom, from what I understood earlier, her mom traveled to Nigeria with the daughter, uh, were you able to find a trace of the passport that she's been using to come to South Africa from Mozambique and also on these movements to Nigeria as well? I mean, are you yeah, looking at possible multiple passports here that she has? Yes, we're definitely looking at multiple passports that uh, the person will possess because if she was traveling on the South African uh, passport, will be able to pick her up, which will have also been issued under the cloud, as I've indicated, under the citizenship that was only obtained. So we are dealing with the situation where we have a person moving in and out using multiple uh, access documents, which will have been obtained probably from Mozambique, because we have been able to establish that she's actually a Mozambican citizen, but we will not know how she actually arrived to get there. All that we know is that the the matter is now with the Hawks and we are looking for her so that she can answer before the law on the criminality that was committed. Okay, so this is just one case, but there are many, many, many other cases out there of identity theft. Uh, I saw that your multidisciplinary task team mm. has found massive fraud and corruption, particularly by foreign nationals right. attempting to stay in the country. How extensive is the rot and, and which permits did this largely affect? Well, let me tell you, sometime about two or three years ago, uh, in the sixth administration, we had identified about 700,000 IDs that would have been uh, in possession of some people who would have obtained them in an illegal manner. Mm -hmm. We actually wrote to those people. Now we're looking at a number of about more than 600,000. These are people who obtained their identity when our systems were still weak in the 90s. They were able to obtain green barcoded IDs. When we moved into the smart card, in 2013, we then discovered that there were cases of duplicate. Some of these people had taken loans with banks and so on. We then had the responsibility of clamping down on them. We did what is called blocking off of those IDs. So that should tell you the picture of what we are dealing with. We also wrote to all those more than 600,000 people to come and make representations. Most of them have not made recommendations, uh, made the representation. So as such, we are going to be taking away those identity documents. Yeah. At the core of everything has been the paper records and the fact that the green barcoded ID was easy to defraud. When we moved to the smart card, it became difficult. And that is why now we are clamping down, we want to stop the green barcoded ID from being issued, which means in the near future we'll no longer be issuing them, we'll only issue smart ID cards. Yeah. But the 600,000 plus were clamping down on them as well. Sure, that's over half a million. Um, that, that's, that, that's, that's quite shocking. So, some of the fraudulent applications were processed at night or over weekends. How was that, this particular activity not picked up as irregular? Yeah. Well, this, as, as I've indicated, most of these things were happening a long time ago when we're not having the systems that we have now. When we got in as a sixth admin, in the sixth administration, we identified that there were a lot of gaps in the system. That is why we then tasked uh, the team led by Lubis to look into the system, which then resulted into the multidisciplinary team that was presenting today. They've actually done very good work because we wanted them to say, this is where your systems are weak. This is where you need to improve. 
And some of these things will then be done uh, after hours. We then had to make sure that we clock the system to lock it down so that it does not process operations after hours. But you must remember, these things take collaboration. It has to be a corrupt official. It has to be a citizen that is willing to give away their citizenship, more so in the case of photo swaps, and then it will be a foreign national yeah. who is willing to buy. But we are clamping down of them. We already have uh, more than 13 arrests. Almost every month we are arresting some people yeah. on this, which means that we are getting closer to the situation and we are correcting whatever will have gone wrong. Yeah, and it's also a little too late. And I know it's better late than never, uh, Deputy Minister, but you didn't have to wait for the sixth administration to start a process like this. The delay in actually getting your systems work has opened a wider door. Now we're sitting with over almost half a million, in fact, of people out there who are sitting with IDs that they have obtained irregularly and fraudulently. You must remember, uh, Clement, that as you try and improve your systems, the thugs and criminals are not sitting back and just waiting for you and watching you. They are actually planning to try and be a step ahead. So these transgressions are not only with regard to the sixth administration. We are talking about paper records. We are talking about a long time ago, around 1994, South Africa had its influence of democracy. This is how this accumulation of 600,000 actually came into being. What is good is that we were able to pick it up uh, through the improvement of our systems. Even now, we are talking about moving by building digital home affairs, which will disallow the use of papers, which will computerize everything. That will make even our systems much more better so that we always stay a curve ahead yeah. of our detractors who will want to forge our documents. Yeah, I suppose what I'm saying is that process you're outlining now should have started much, much earlier. Nothing stopped government from starting earlier. By the fourth, administri <laughs> by the fourth administration, this was already a crisis. Well, probably it is an issue of the systems and the capacity that was there and the technology that was available okay. at that particular time. But we are dealing with the matter now. Those who did wrong will face the music. We are affecting arrest as we speak. Jabulo Nziza is the Deputy Minister at Home Affairs. Thank you so much for making time for us on Face the Nation tonight. After the break, the Mayor of Johannesburg, Dada Morero. Stay with us. Welcome back. Now, a week ago, the mayor of Johannesburg, Dada Morero, placed his predecessor, Cabello Guamanda, who is the MMC for Community Development on Special Leave, due to charges of fraud and corruption. Guamanda allegedly defrauded people through a burial scheme. Now, Kosatu in Gauteng says the accusations that are leveled against Guamanda raises some serious questions regarding the vetting processes, and they are calling for Guamanda to be dismissed with immediate effect. Now, we've invited the mayor of Johannesburg to speak to us about that issue and some of the issues also facing the city of Johannesburg. And he joins us now in studio. Mayor, thank you so much for making time. Good evening. Thank you, thank you, Clement. I want to start off with the issue of Gabelo Kwamanda. Were you surprised by the charges that he faced when he got arrested? Well, you'd remember that the allegations did surface uh, 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 already by last year. Uh, but unfortunately, Allegations remain allegations until they are tested. Mm -hmm. And of course, his arrest then confirmed that indeed uh, there's probably a case to answer. And as a result of that, we consulted internally uh, and of course also consulted with the Integrity Commission of the city and our legal department on what course of action should we take. And legally, they would have advised that would have to follow the necessary due process within the city and the best possible option at that particular time was to put him on special leave mm. uh, so that we can also assess and look at the merits of the case uh, of which he did call me uh, immediately or after he was at the police station to say look uh, executive mayor was arrested on the basis of the following allegations and he's out on bail and he would like uh, to brief me further, which I accepted on a Tuesday, the following Tuesday, met with him, understood the issues. And I did tell him at that point that I'd have to place him on special leave. Yeah. So you've had an opportunity now to look at the merits of the case, um, the seriousness of the charges. Uh, I was looking at the FSCA investigation that was done last year because they said that he operated an illegal 
business and disappeared when his clients were looking for their money. They also said that he possessed or he posed as a financial services provider without the required license. Isn't that serious and concerning enough to warrant his dismissal? As opposed well, that, to when the allegations did surface, we took it serious that these matters are quite serious. Uh, but uh, you'd realize after his arrest, all these things started to, to be confirmed. And of course, we're finalizing a few things internally so that we can take the appropriate action on this matter. Uh, you don't want to have acted on the basis of a person being arrested and charged and you probably fire him and then the courts come and say he's cleared, there's no, uh, he's free, he's a mm -hmm. free man and you had acted to fire him when in fact you should allow that process to happen and consult with your legal people to yeah. advise, to say in light of this, in light of that, what do we do? And that's the process that I'm still engaged in. Yeah. And I thought I should respect those processes. Otherwise, uh, I would have acted uh, out of emotions and I don't want to yeah. do that. Uh, except, I suppose, the difference thing with this is that the FSCA revealed the outcome of their investigation last year already. So it was even before the arrest. And that's a respectable state institution that's linked to the state. When it says this person operated an illegal business, this person disappeared when his clients were looking for him, he posed as a financial advisor without the required license. Isn't that serious? Look, the matters were never raised within the processes of council at that time. And if they were raised within council, I think the ethics committee of council would have acted on those matters. And at that time, I was an ordinary MMC, so if the matters were to be raised, it would have been raised with the executive mayor, uh, and or probably with the speaker of council, uh, to say this is the recommendations that are coming out, and mm. it's their responsibility to act. Now, unfortunately, all these things happen at the point where I'm now the mayor, mm. and uh, he was then arrested at the point mm. where I'm the mayor, so I'm required to act. Mm. And I think I acted uh, correctly within the policy framework of the city to allow a process, so that there's proper due processes. Uh, but, uh, uh, and I think that's what I needed yeah. to do. Uh, but yes, there's, 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 there's concerns about the gravity of the matters and would have to act accordingly as the city and allow us at least some space to conclude what we, are, we have to conclude internally because cancer has its own processes and we can't bypass them. Uh, mm. uh, we have to follow them and give him due process and then we'll advise uh, accordingly quite soon. Yeah, but when you appointed him as the Community Safety MMC, the FSCA had already said this. Why, why was this recommendation, this outcome ignored? No, uh, they didn't raise that. Probably this was they, last year already? Probably they raised it in the media. It was not written. There was no letter. I might not have seen it at that time. Don't you vet uh, the people? Let me come to the vetting. The ANC does a vetting. Mm. Of all its public reps, uh, including our councillors, who go through a rigorous process of uh, 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 record checks, uh, uh, and they also check community checks, etc. That's what the ANC does, and I went through a process. Uh, as to what happens into other parties, I, I, I don't have control or authority to probably say this is how they should do things, uh, but the NC does that. Two, the IEC, before we become councillors, they conduct a basic uh, record checks to confirm uh, because there are certain uh, uh, stipulations in the law that says you can't be a public rep if the, you have done the following, you were just sentenced, etc., etc. So that process, I suppose, he went through it with the IEC and nothing was found. Now, I think it's the only process that the, the ANC does. We do it rigorously. Mm. I can't account for an MMC from other the parties. ANC. Now, do, they, do you vet those MMC? Yeah, no, from no. The All of us as the ANC were vetted before we become councillors. So risky though, because that means there's a risk of people passing the basic test of the IEC because it's really quite basic, um, and they can end up in well, positions of authority, yes, which is it's, quite it's, dangerous. It's, it's quite, it's quite risky. But the ANC process is quite tight. I would remember that a few instances where a name had to be withdrawn 
just at the point of registration because we have now uncovered a proper report on a particular in, uh, individual. So our process is the ANC and we take it seriously uh, as the ANC. Unfortunately, with other parties and what also makes it uh, more difficult to any coalition arrangement, so we can't dictate to those parties how they should uh, conduct their own vetting of their own individuals. All what we understand, there was no issue from the IEC and therefore uh, being a councillor, he's also being en entitled to can be appointed in a mayoral committee. So I want to make sure I'm understanding you correctly. So now you are negotiating or discussing with the legal team what to do next because you've gone through the merits um, the findings of the S uh, FSCA, you're hearing more of the victims speaking out and talking yes. about how they have been, and you take this matter seriously. So you are now looking and considering whether or not the dismissal is the option to go with. Well, the legal team is weighing all those options. I did talk to them today, and hopefully by Wednesday, Thursday, on Thursday, mm. I will be with the team for them to give me a concrete feedback and then we will test that feedback with our integrity commissioner. And once the integrity commissioner also feels this the type of action we must take, we will do so. Yeah, and of course the residents are also concerned about him continuously receiving the salary because they feel like there's a financial burden um, on the city, which is why they, some of them support the approach of dismissal. No, no, when we are on suspension anyway, mm. uh, the conditions of suspension dictate. And in this case, suspension conditions mm. did not say we withdraw the salary. I mean, there's a whole mm. lot of people in the public service, okay. the private service, private sector want suspension, uh, but the law allows for them to still continue to draw a salary pending the conclusion of their case. Okay, we'll, we'll wait uh, to hear on Thursday once you've got that feedback from the legal team. Yes. Let's talk about some of the issues affecting the city now. What is behind what seems to be a, the water crisis in Johannesburg now? Well, the water crisis is actually a provincial crisis, mm. uh, but the uh, challenges in terms of one consumption, which our consumption as the residents of Johannesburg is way above what we've been allocated by rainwater, for example. Is that because of leaks or anything else? The number of factors. One is behavior, ourselves as residents. Uh, we use uh, clean water for drinking, for washing our vehicles, for irrigation and all sorts of things. Two, it's illegal connections uh, throughout your informal settlements by passing of water meters in some communities, which contribute to the challenges. And of course, it's the leaks of the infrastructure, which is old, requires refurbishment, requires huge amounts. There is work that we are also doing, as you'd be aware that uh, uh, we are also bringing one of the biggest uh, 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 reservoir just around this area uh, so that we can try and ensure that there's no more disruptions uh, in this area. So we're doing work to refurbish and build uh, new water reservoirs as part of intervening in the crisis. But the crisis is not more about availability. It's about us using the water and conserving the water resources that we have. And I think that's the message you would want to take uh, to our communities and residents that let's use this water sparingly. It's a scarce resource and the challenges are real. So Johannesburg, we have to try our level best to reduce the consumption and use drinking water for drinking, cooking, and uh, avoid using it for washing your car. And what's the status with the finances in the city? That's our one of the our things finances you... has improved quite uh, uh, remarkably. Uh, we have shown in a, a consistent collection of just above between 4.8 billion and 5 billion, which indicates that we are achieving what. I mean, Over what period did you uh, witness no, that? No, in the last three, four months, we've been uh, collecting just around uh, 5 billion which is what we've been wanting to collect. I mean, which gives us an improvement from 86% mm. to just around 89%. But the mayors have always been struggling to crack that. What are you doing differently? Well, we sat down with the team and we said, look, let's build a war room, a war room which must meet constantly. Every Tuesday, crack out queries, crack out accounts that have not been paid, get uh, services to cut off, uh, enforce uh, cutoffs and also enforce bylaws 
so that you deal with illegal connections. And that has started to give us the results. And uh, we're also looking at the communication that we're able to do with our uh, uh, LPU customers, uh, our large uh, uh, customers that we've been engaging them on payments and making better mm -hmm. arrangements for them to come and pay. So those results are beginning to see them now. Okay, and just lastly, the issue of uh, roads and, and bridges. Um, I, I found out the other day that I think about 80% or so of our bridges are really in imminent danger of collapse. They're not structurally sound. Um, when you look at our roads as well, motorists in Johannesburg always complain about potholes what, what's the status there? Because the GRA, when you speak to them, tell you that, yeah, we do what we can, but we really don't have enough funds for actual maintenance that, that, that is needed yeah. for, for us to Look, have a long-term plan. Over time, the, the, the maintenance budget has just been just around 5%, when in fact, it should be at 8%, and that's what we're trying to do now. Uh, to try and correct that space and increase our maintenance budget mm. to 8%, which is a national norm, which suggests that you'll be able to do quite a few things. Two, in terms of the water infrastructure, we've also launched a infrastructure fund. We are saving at least 1% of our re water revenue towards the fund so that we can contribute towards infrastructure. On the road infrastructure, yes, it's true, quite a number of our breaches uh, are not in a good state, it requires refurbishment. So we've been doing them gradually because we may not have uh, that money at once. So we are raising and we're also talking to province to see how best they can also contribute uh, to assist to deal with breaches, which is a big challenge, it's true. Uh, portals, I think we're doing much better. Uh, there are challenges there and there. But I must also explain that, uh, which of course, it means nothing to, to the residents of Johannesburg that you have a municipal road, you have a provincial road, and in some instances a national road in one strip. Mm -hmm. And you'd find that this side has been done, this side has not been done. So there's contracts that we are now beginning to reshape with the provincial government so that we can attend mm -hmm. to those things efficiently. All right, Johannesburg Mayor Tada Morero, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. After the break, we'll start our conversation with the National Police Commissioner, Fanny Masamola. Stay with us. Welcome back. The National Police Commissioner, General Fanny Masamola, says it's concerning that 900,000 suspects have been arrested since the inception of Operation Chanela in May last year. Their police operation consists of regular stop and searches, roadblocks, vehicle checkpoints, and the tracing of wanted suspects. Uh, General Masamola says police are also making progress to curb mass shootings that have been making headlines in recent weeks. He's facing uh, the nation tonight, joining us via Zoom. Uh, Commissioner, thank you so much for making time for us. Good evening. Good evening, Clement, to yourself and uh, the viewers. So we have been experiencing a spate of mass shootings in the country with recent cases in the Eastern Cape, Western Cape, Gauteng and KwaZulu-Natal. And this appears to be getting out of control. And I would imagine this requires you as the police to ramp up your efforts. So what's the plan? How are you refining your crime fighting strategy? Thanks, uh, Clement. Uh, our crime uh, combating strategy, which is Operation Chanela, there is a number of activities that we do in that regard, uh, be it roadblocks, coordinate searches, uh, visibility in certain hotspots areas. And uh, that we do with regard to, uh, we reinforce that through additional members. Remember, this time of the year, we minimize leaf. Most of the members are not given leave, so they are on the ground. We also had 2,800 that passed out in the last past two weeks. They are addition to the forces we have on the ground. And uh, we will be focusing all, especially holiday destinations, including all other provinces. And yes, mass shootings we encounter mostly in those provinces counted. 
but through our response, we were able to react. Some of these uh, mass shootings, they are such that it's not easy to get intelligence between a brother and a brother or a brother and a sister, uh, which they are more uh, sort of uh, relatives related. It becomes a bit difficult. You would remember uh, last week we had in Gauti a gentleman who uh, owns a tavern who, after he refused to sell alcohol to people after he have closed, uh, he was slapped with, uh, he was slapped and thereafter he decided to go home, get a fire and go and shoot uh, about more than five people and shoot himself. Uh, those are things that surely police cannot prevent. The guy at the firearm is licensed and uh, he just decided to go and do that. And some, are, as I said, are deeply entrenched within families. Uh, Saturday in uh, Amangwe in Escort, uh, you have seen we have, it was a family function yeah. where some people came and just fired at uh, mm -hmm. certain people there, killing four people. But luckily by yesterday, we arrested all six suspects and we confiscated uh, six firearms, two AK-47 rifles and four pistols. And even the Eastern Cape, uh, most of the mass shootings in the Eastern Cape, we have solved them because we have we're able to arrest immediately yeah. uh, those uh, perpetrators. Okay. Yeah, and, and these shootings are often perpetrated with illegal and unlicensed firearms. I mean, some of them are high caliber weapons. Why is there such a proliferation of illegal arms on our streets? Uh, Clement, uh, some of these firearms, well, except the AK-47s, mm. some of these firearms would have been legal at some point. Mm. They were owned by either government departments, including ASAPs and all other law enforcement agencies, and including departments that are not law enforcement agencies and municipalities. And some would have been owned by private owners, which either they were robbed or they lost them, and they get into their own hands. But we have stepped up our efforts in making sure that we must continuously carry on with uh, confiscating firearms. Hence, since 1st of April to now, we confiscated 4,400 firearms that we have taken out of the criminals' hands and making sure they are out forever. Mm -hmm. Isn't the problem also that there is little done to ensure accountability when firearms are lost by even some government agencies or departments. Because some security analysts believe that most government entities, even the SANDF, for instance, fail to notify authorities about fire, firearm losses and thefts. So there could be a lot more firearms in the wrong hands out there that you are not aware of. Uh, well, in terms of law, Clement, departments do compliance. We also do a uh, firearm compliance check on other departments, of course, except this India, they, they do it themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, even some uh, security companies, we all security companies, we do compliance. Where we find uh, a deficit in terms of firearms that are unaccounted for, they op we open cases and people get punished both criminally and also departmentally, depending on uh, which... Uh, if, if it's not a, if it's an individual, of course, you can only uh, do consequence management through criminal cases. But in departments, we do take action, and other departments they do same also. Yeah. So crime is obviously a battle that you will only win with the cooperation of our communities, and and that sometimes comes through police informers in communities. But there have been reports that the amount that they are being paid has been slashed and and i'd like to you know get get your reflection on, on that is that the case and how does that affect intelligence gatherings in communities because that's quite crucial in the battle and the prevention of the crimes themselves uh is yeah, that is a misleading uh, statement uh, mm. clement there will be those that wants to mislead the whole of the society in believing that all what is done is uh, there are control measures that are put in terms of how much you pay for what. Mm. Clement, you can't, for example, give, uh, give me information about one bag of Daha and maybe I give you 100 or 200,000. Mm. So, so it's just a matter of accountability 
Uh, that is a misleading statement to say all uh, informers get given 3,000 rand. Yeah. There are levels of commanders with a delegated certain amount which they can give, which I don't have to disclose yet. So, but that is misleading. And uh, informers, they do get paid accordingly in terms of the worth of the information that they supply to the mm. police. Okay. And uh, we are quite pleased. The intelligence uh, division is quite improving in terms of performance. Mm. Let's touch a bit on transactional organized crime syndicates. Uh, police have managed to intercept a number of drug traffickers at OR Tambo International Airport. Many of them swallow these drugs, you know, endangering their lives. How concerned are you about the possibility of these interventions being a decoy, sort of to distract the security from someone else who may be trafficking a significant amount of drugs? Uh, Clement, we, we, we are quite long in the game. When you give us information on something, mm. we know that you might be giving us a decoy, uh, either in the same or Tambo or either in Durban or either in uh, Cape Town. So we are vigilant uh, at all times. When we get intelligence about, let's say, one passenger, one bag, we obviously make sure we open our eyes, we look quite far out. And uh, the cooperation between us and uh, the foreign uh, security services, uh, like your Brazilian police and other police agencies, mm. the UK, is quite good. And uh, we exchange quite uh, information. Hence, we have seen we have arrested the over uh, 14 drug mules in, in three months period. Even those that were coming to South Africa, but via other countries thinking they would come, they would arrive here, yeah. we're able to make sure they get arrested wherever they go. Okay. Um, b before I let you get, co Commissioner, how are you addressing this conflict that's being reported uh, between the crime intelligence boss, Major General Dumisani Kumalo, and the head of counter security, Major, G Major General Feroz Khan? I mean, already crime intelligence is sort of troubled. The last thing you need is a conflict that could potentially paralyze this unit. Uh, well, it, it is uh, purported in the public eye as, as, as conflict. Mm -hmm. But take it from me, the commander or the divisional commissioner of crime intelligence have got no uh, conflict with any other of his employees. First, he, he's not the first, he's not the one that started all this. Uh, things happen wherever they happen. He received, actually, I received a report from the IPD saying employee X have done one, two, three, which Clement is not the first one I get. I get this report every month, depending whose name is on the report. And I give that report to the immediate supervisor of the specific officer or member. Mm. And it is expected by uh, myself and all other structures, including public, that we take action where there is a, a, a allegation of misconduct. And the supervisor, which in this case is the divisional commissioner, just started the action. And uh, then all of a sudden, but it's also a right of employee to go to court and do whatever. But there is no, maybe somebody or he might be fighting the divisional commissioner, but the divisional commissioner is not part of the fight. He's mm -hmm. just implementing what is expected of him, which he has initiated a disciplinary process. All right. National Police Commissioner, General uh, Fanima Samola, really appreciate your time on Face the Nation tonight. Thank you very much, Clement, and your viewers. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up after the break, we're going to sit down with Pastor Pasika Mutswaneng. Stay with us. Although TB can be cured, around 54,000 people in our country still die of TB every year. We can't accept this. Visit the clinic if you are coughing, losing weight or having night sweat. Get tested. If you are found to have TB, you'll be started on treatment. You must take treatment as informed by the nurse or doctor until completion. Yes, together we can end TB.
When the nights are quiet, Africa and the world keeps its pace. Stories unfold and nations embrace. Late edition, where silence meets analysts. And commentators bring the truth to view. Stay awake with us for the night's tale never fades. Catch the pulse, catch the day's wave on Late Edition. Late Edition, every evening from 9pm to midnight, only on the SABC News Channel. Welcome back. Now, we've been asking you a question uh, this evening on Face the Nation on what do you think needs to be done to address this crisis of fraud and the application and allocation of visas. So let's take a look at some of your tweets uh, that have come through. Elon says the department should do the following. Enhance screening and verification, transparent and standardized screening, digitization and automation, employee screening and training, auditing and independent <coughs> oversight. Michael says the Department of Home Affairs needs to upgrade their systems and introduce systems that will assist them to pick up irregularities immediately. Morales says there is something called integrity testing which could be incorporated into the department's anti-corruption strategy. International best practices are available. In addition, lifestyle audits must also be periodically conducted among staff. All right, let's start our conversation with Pastor Basika <coughs> Boromotswaneng. Uh, remember him and his co-accused bodyguard will be back in court on the 11th of November. They're facing charges of kidnapping, the possession of an unlicensed, unlicensed firearm, discharging a firearm, assault and malicious damage to property. Uh, Pastor Mboro joins us now in studio for a conversation. Thank you so much for making time for us, Pastor Mboro. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for having me. So it's, it's been quite a while since you've been out of prison. How have you been? How's your family? Well, God is good. Uh, we are taking it day by day, step by step. Uh, our lives are hidden together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We live the word. We think the word is just to focus in God and not conforming to the standards of the world because if you can put your mind into uh, really one will, ha will end up being hospitalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you had a moment, because how long has it been now since you've been out of, um, out of prison? A couple of weeks? Probably a month eh, at yeah, most? I think it's... Uh, <laughs> I'm not counting. Yeah. Uh, really, I'm not. I think... Um, but it's over a month. Yeah. I it's think, over a month. I think so, yeah. <clears throat> Have you had an opportunity to reflect on how things unfolded and your actions as well when you went to the school and what are your reflections now that you've had time to just grow through the events of that day? I saw how people can use uh, social media, how people can manipulate, uh, how cruel people can be and also that life is unpredictable. Uh, you know, the scripture says, don't say tomorrow I'll do this. Say, if the Lord uh, grants you that grace, because you are not in charge. So just in one day, mm. I didn't know that I'll spend 40 days in jail. Uh, I hear the allegations you put, all lies. Uh, I thank God for this because... <clears throat> You see how corrupt, how wicked, crooked the justice system is and how can it be used mm. for so many innocent lives uh, who are in jail. If something like this could happen to me, especially in a, a, a woman's month, you know, this gender-based thing where women will manipulate uh, the... A district commissioner, general, mm. uh, the provincial commissioner. Uh, we had the national commissioner now. <clears throat> you, you, you see the Department mm. of Education. And they, they warn you before that we are in charge. Yeah. We have this connection. 
they attack you on the second and they tell you what is going to happen mm. like a prophecy and you open a case you state these people say they are going to do this mm. we are going to be killed we're going to be broken bones they have high ranking officers they have prosecutors they have the department and uh, they say no uh, this one happened. You do everything. Mm -hmm. You send your son to school to say, uh, notify the principal, let him be aware that after break, I mean, after school, he must have the police stand by. You don't want to uh, bring bodyguards and, mm. and all that. You depend on the police. You go there. <laughs> Unarmed, I have a very powerful uh, security force. Uh, example, when Iskabe uh, sent people to shoot at us at church, uh, I survived that. We oh, between us and the police station is just defense. Mm. They didn't help us. Mm. We had to get the intervention of General Kumalo in the province, mm. who gave us Colonel Mere of the public police. We had to be assisted when the gang promised mm. to return. And they also, so this whole thing okay. is plotted by the district police, mm. uh, Katlong uh, uh, North Police, and now this family, because they had, it had to be a collaborated thing to, yeah. to do that. When you say that they are all lies, are you, because we, we've seen the video of you holding them. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because that's not a lie. Yeah, you, you, you know? see. <laughs> and, and that's what's happening. You were threatening the teachers as they were trying to calm you down. You were doing that in front of the little kids that you were trying to protect as well. Yeah, that you, is see, not a you, lie. you see, look at this. There. They show you this, ne? Yeah. They don't show you people with stones mm. when they were throwing stones who was throwing stones at you uh, the family gang uh. you've got mrs malaza's uh, people son if you will watch there there's a guy on a blue uh, I think but he's see. outside you, before you that see. before that happened uh, you were you were these are the teachers we we're trying tell to me say. where are the kids here there he's carrying the kids there behind now you. how many kids no they, this this are my grandkids that's what i'm talking about they were beaten together with their father, he was bleeding. The Do you see that here? The kids were beaten by who? You've got Coco Webster, who is a teacher there, who is a sister to the grandmother. Ne? You've got the prince, deputy principal, mm. and you've got Nkosana, the, the uncle. They beat up the kids. If you beat a man holding kids, kicking, slapping, they are crying, they are screaming, pa, 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 pa. And this woman, what, what she's doing, she's just, here I'm rescuing. Here's a father rescuing. He was already taken, grabbed hostage, mm. being there to fetch his children. Mm. But the children are already fetched. When you watch no, this no, video, no. You, you see, Burrow. You see here, you see the video when, when, we are, we, when we are there. When I got there first, mm. there were no nothing. Is that the way, though, to address issues? Because I imagine no, no, no. when there's you an know issue what? like Don't that, come with that you can, me. let me, let me put it, I'll give you a chance. I think mm. I'll, I'll um, listen to you. you are a pastor that is respected in a community. Mm. You're a leader of, of society. When, when people are doing wrong things, whether they're beating the kids, the responsible ah, thing on, to man. do is come to on, go man. open a case. It's come not on, to man. bring pangas and bring I'm, weapons I'm, at a school. I told you that we opened the case on Monday. Mm. Still Monday. doesn't justify. No, for you. For you. So if you've opened the case, you can just Listen take guns to me. and pangas. You come, uh, 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 six people come to your house. You, you know, the, the, the in-laws of your son, women. Mm. They beat you in your house. Mm. They come with the police. Without any court order that say they must take the children. The children were born in your house, mm. who were raised by you and your son and your daughter-in-law. Being such a powerful man, you are beaten. Mm. 
The police are not doing anything. The very police who claim I'm a flight risk, I, I cannot be traced, I can be. We open the case. They tell us in front of the police that on Monday, bring these kids and don't, don't fetch them. If you don't, we are going to hunt you and kill you. Mm. We have high-ranking officers. We have the prosecutors. We, have the, we are mm. going to show you. And that is wrong. You know, mm. in front of, then Monday, you ask the police to come and intervene. You tell the principal. They are not, they refuse to go. Your son goes in there. He gets beaten, locked up. Is that okay? Locked up there. You go there. You see that now it's five past two. Let me go. You arrive there. Uh, nothing has happened. 20 past two, you get, you get in. You hear the teachers are saying that there's a man here who is grabbing the children, he's kidnapping the children. He must be beaten. You arrive there, they beat you. You are not having any, any weapon. You go in there. Uh, you find, you hear, this is my son. You see him down there being kicked. And then you say to them, listen, I'm going to, you scare them. Try to scare them. Ne? I'm going to get guns. I'm going to get a backup. We're going to shoot you. Mm. Uh, 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 you can't kill my, he's bleeding like this. You, your grandkids are, but your son, are I didn't no, see no, your no. son bleeding there in the We video. have the video. You see what they are doing? They are, show showing, that video? they are showing uh, 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 what, they are, what, mm. what, what their side. Do you have a video of your son being beaten and bleeding? Can yes, Can you show we do. it to us? Can we show it to the viewers now as you leave now? Can you send it to me so we yes. can slide it on air? Yes, I'll you show, promise I'll show. to the viewers right now that you're going to give us a video of your son being beaten and bleeding gonna, that we're going to show listen, tonight. I'm going to show you his bruises and, and, and all that. Remember, okay. they were, no, let, let me finish. Yeah. They were in charge of the shooting. Mm -hmm. I mean, of, 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 of the whole thing. When you try to, to do whatever, the pangas, we had to go back mm. and get this to unlock the door. Okay. None of them was hurt. This panga that you were doing this to the teachers was to unlock the door. You, you, you see, the problem is you can think what you want, uh. but there are videos. We unlocked the, the, the butler. Yeah. They had no right to beat and lock him That's there. That's true. That is wrong. So it was just to open and, and, and then it was open. Why for haven't him. you published this video so South Africans see this injustice? They anymore? are there on the social media platform, Sam. I you, have not seen that and I've followed this story very closely. You, you know what is happening? They push this to paint me. If you can see here, we are trying to run away. They are but they don't have weapons. They're just saying, it is more. They don't show you that. Okay, okay. You, you so, see, so, this is, this after, is after the show, Mr. Mzana, as long as we agree that after the show, people yeah, no. well, that are watching, I will be posting videos of Mr. Mutsuaneng's son bleeding and being beaten up on social media as yeah. well. Um, so that the, the, that the viewers happened, can see that. that. How are they, where are the kids now? How are they doing? Uh, you, you, you see, we are trying to run away. They... If you can see, uh, it doesn't show you. And I'm not, I'm just scaring them to go. You see, we go, okay, they come. I will show you even the videos where they were kicking us. Mm -hmm. If I, I wanted to, I was just telling you what, why, why General Kumalo gave us a colonel mayor of the mm -hmm. public. I said when those guys coming to shoot, I said to him, we are going to the hostel. I will get 30 to 40 guys with AKs, security uh, 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 people who are trained, who follow the law, because there's a court order, there's everything, these people keep coming. I want them, if they have to kill me, let's do it there, not in front of the people. And then because they call me in spite of the court order. The police, your Sifoloshi, your Nguepe, those guys who applied for J50 when mm -hmm. I'm in their custody, uh, uh, J-50 is for someone who is nowhere to be found. In their custody. Mm. And then uh, who were instructed to come to my house and forcefully open the case against those. Mm. So because I did that, now they used all this. Some okay. of the evidence, it's, it, it's, it's, mm. it's on the phone. They locked me there with, the, that gun is not a gun. What it's a that? it's a replica. When they disarm it and uh, they saw it, we okay. have the videos that shows. How, how are the kids? Because uh, I'm I'm out of time. How All are right. the kids doing now? The, the, 
the kids, this, this lies. They said they were chronically ill, both of them. Uh, it was only one kid. Mm. The kid that they mentioned his name was not chronically ill. Mm. But are they okay? Because they uh, must be traumatized after You know when we're in prison, uh, you went, the other one had to mess himself at school. Their trauma, they were saying even themselves, they don't want to go to that school because they saw the family okay. uh, beating their father. It's not the community that was attacking But are us. they safe now, the kids? They are safe, okay. but they had to change the school. The court gave a wrong um, a judgment because it was misinformed. Right. Yeah, first of they, all. They, 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 they had no custody. Mm. Finally, we do have, we are the ones with the interim okay. first uh, uh, order. Uh, all the proofs, okay. if, 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 they, they were there. Okay, Pastor Mbora, yeah. I appreciate you coming through to studio to share your story with us. Thank you so much. And thanks to you for watching the Tuesday edition of Face the Nation. We'll be back with you on Thursday at 8 p.m. Thanks for watching. Cheers.